Okay guys, so now I'm reading about this book. And I enjoyed this thought, so. Okay. Folklore that comes to us through colonial transmission, on the other hand, was compiled to provide essentially an entirely different sort of data, ethnographic data about a subjugated people aimed at specifically at the education and entertainment of their subjugators. It was a data collected about a certain people, but not for those people. Colonial folklore created a particular set of data outside the aesthetic or artistic, and the canon we inherit today bears traces of that data gathering. Our mainstream literacy discourse continues to read writers of color ethnographically, as if they provide crucial data about a certain subjugated group of people, and white writers universally, regardless of the particularities of their work. So what she's saying is how like white people have a universal experience that's like, oh, they can do anything, be anything, you know, and then black people is just well, this is what we want to learn about. We want to learn about how you were a slave. We want to learn about how you guys grew up in the hood. That's like what I'm getting from this for me, right? And um, yeah, gathered folklore, gathered. So yeah, there's heavily biased data transmitted through their dubiously gathered folklore has a corollary in the contemporary practice of reading writers of color to learn more about whatever tragic slice of history has become most recently relevant to that readership. Education and empathy became resources to mind, not ongoing practices to question and transform one's life, one's work, one's agency to power. So yeah, the idea of we're learning more about you is just like a one-off thing. And it's not really made to, again, think, oh, well, how am I in a position of power? And how have I been, like, using my power to hurt others? How can I change that? No, it's just, oh, well, now I know about slavery. Oh, now I know you got beat. Okay, thank you. Bye. Like, that's literally the energy um, that I see. And so something that, like, is how she brought up Cinderella and how the chariot turned into a pumpkin, right? So... Um, in Peralt's hands, a pumpkin is just something that will turn into a vehicle. It's just a fairy around a would-be princess wife, pale and glittering. It's a chariot to fairy around, right? And yet, for others, a squash is an entire world. One Taino creation myth about the birth of Puerto Rico, Boriquen, to its indigenous people, describes the entire ocean and all its inhabitants contained within a pumpkin. And it's like things like that. You see how colo colonial colonizers, they change the entire like narrative about this thing. Like I would never think of how like the squash, the pumpkin was feeding nations of like Taino peoples and how like pumpkins are not native to like where Cinderella was at because it was based in like France it was just something taken from you know the native people of like China type people right and so like they make these this folklore and they really shape like narratives and what we know when Nathani and Morrison and playing in the dark give us lessons on how to read stories they're also giving us lessons on how to resurrect the history latent in them yeah so that those stories can be more fully manifested to us who are the inheritors, not just of these stories, but the world that those stories have made. Or as the contemporary Inuit and Haitian Taino poet Siku Alulu writes in the poem, Survival's Guilt. My ancestors say we have always been here. My job is to house the always for a while. My job is to do this despite you. Okay, so here's another excerpt starting with things like write what you know or show don't tell. Those are things that were taught, right? Write what you know and show don't tell. Growing up, that kid who was obsessed with Cinderella and Greek myths would, wanted, would have wanted to hear something else, something more like write what you don't know, write about what you supposedly know. 
Write about what you haven't ever felt permitted to call knowledge, about what you see and feel and live. Show that which exceeds your ability to tell it. Tell that which exceeds your ability to show it. We're on page 295. And there was another page where she talked about the origin of the word text and how text came from a word called textia and it means like to weave. And I assume it's like saying how she said that to say how like when you write and you have a text, you're weaving what people think about the world, something like that. When I think about reading and writing, I necessarily think about silences, erasures, oblivions, and misremembrances pockets of inarticulacy, things that are nameless in me, which might touch or be touched by things that are nameless in others. And she says that, that our lives are often incomprehensible to us is not just a human fact, part of the mystery of being alive, the mystery of being in the world. It's also a fundamental part of colonial, colonialities legacy knowing that there are knowledges that are never counted never mind recorded as knowledges this is really the beginning of a decolonial reading let alone writing no understanding of the classics from the fairy tale to the greek myth is complete without that reckoning when we say we know what a monster is when we say we know what a hero is how do we come to know those things what does that knowledge permit us to believe about our world and how does that knowledge shape how we live in that world, let alone how we read and write in it? We're on page 296. How can we think about storytelling not just as a holy incident, innocent, or politically neutral act, but as something that carries within it the capacity for epistemic violence and erasure, a kind of power that we're often reluctant to acknowledge when we want to unilaterally praise the moral good of reading and storytelling so overall the book is about decolonizing your mind how do we hold ourselves accountable to the root of the word accountable meaning how do we let the story of ourselves be told how do we hold ourselves accountable to the things we've received and internalized the knowledges and the unknowledges the narratives silences and violences and the peculiarities so let's um, go into this. The fact that I know my last name is Castillo. Castillo, my family and most Filipino people I know, Philippine X, of course, from Luzon and North would pronounce that name Castillo, not the Spanish pronunciation Castillo. Castillo is the work of remembering. The concept of the surname in the Philippines is a young one. It begins only around 1849 with the Clavilla Decree, a Spanish colonial law issued by the Government General of the Philippines, Narciso Clavilla y Zaldua, requiring natives to adopt the name from the Catalogo Alfabetico de Apellidos, or adopt the name from the Catalog of Surnames for the Spanish Empire's legal and civil use. The catalog included both Spanish and indigenous surnames, along with words from the animal, mineral, and vegetable kingdoms, geographical terms, artistic terms. Though overwhelming, the majority of the words in the catalog were indeed Spanish, and the indigenous words were, of course, transcribed by Spanish speakers, following Spanish phonetics and Spanish grammar. Ha, ah, no surprise. It was sent to different towns and settlements across the archipelago with locals free to choose their own names, quote unquote free, like picking a shape in the Squid Game's Dalgona Honeycomb Challenge. Trace these lines and hope you don't die. Here was freedom and bondage woven together, an illusory freedom of choosing, quote unquote, one's own name, but only at the pleasure of the colonial state for the convenience of its administrative efficiency. The lack of distinctive native family names in the archipelago made the daily practices of the empire difficult. After all, how could one reliably collect the maximum amount of tax revenue from this, from these diffuse social groups whose connection to each, of all, uh, each other could not be codified according to European civil structures? The tribes people who share children but did not share a name even count as family? Well, wow, you can be a family without sharing a name? No way, no fuck way. Certainly not a good Christian one. 
how could one be sure a birth or marriage was legitimate? At least according to the only authority that mattered, shredded white Jesus. The only people exempt from choosing a name from the catalogo were those who had either adopted a name from the list at an earlier time or could prove that their own last name, surname, has been in use for at least four generations, which most likely would comprise of archipelagos, mestizos, Spanish, and Chinese middle class.